Yeah, the little boy was listening to his parents and others around the table uh, arguing and talking politics. And uh, everyone was calling uh, every politician a liar. And finally, the little boy said to his dad, Dad, don't the politicians ever tell the truth? And the father said, only when they call each other liars. <laughs> you know, we could go on and on about how politicians tell you one thing and then do something quite otherwise or talk about a condition, and then uh, we know that it's really not that at all. Uh, they have what they call spin doctors. There's actually spin rooms, so that when something is told and it's not the way they like it, they go put the spin on it. We live in a world full of spin. The truth is rarely told. We're spin doctors ourselves. How you feeling? I'm fine. You know what? It happens like this. You have a little spat with your spouse on the way to church. And so you're, you're, you're pretty heated. Your voices are raised. And, you know, then all of a sudden you come into the church and the person says, hello. I mean, you've been just going, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to answer you. I'm going to be. And then you get in the church and somebody says hello. And you say, hello. How are you doing? Oh, just fine. We put our own little spin on it. And uh, we don't live the truth. John, in his little letter, is writing about the truth. And he's saying, there's some things you really need to know about the truth. When we look at this, when it comes to the truth, sincerity is not enough. There's a verse in the Bible that goes like this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end, it leads to death. Wow. We live in a culture that's called, we got this thing going on called cancel culture. Cancel culture basically is, Shut up. I don't want to hear what you have to say. It's my way or no one else's way. I'm going to shut you down. They call it, we're getting rid of misinformation. But the problem is, what if the people who are shutting it down are the misinformation people? Whoa. Then what they're shutting down is the truth. We, we as Americans, we pride ourselves in freedom of speech. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It seems so right. Well, the majority of the people believe this. Have the majority ever been wrong? Oh, yes. Even on the Supreme Court, they've been wrong. Saying that a black African-American person is not a full human being. Are you kidding me? But the majority opinion was, yes, at that time. We know that's not true. That's not true. It seemed right to them. But it was wrong. It was wrong. It was wrong. So what this verse says, okay, you, you know, I feel like I am going counterculture on everything in my life. And, and the majority believe differently than I do. Because I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Bible is authoritative for my life in practice, that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and I measure everything by what the Bible says and not by popular opinion. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so I'm on a narrow path in the culture in which I live, and the broad path is leading to destruction, but the narrow path leads unto life. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is the way of death. In Philadelphia, I am not going to name the hospital, but they had a major follow-up. Everybody was sincerely doing their job, the doctors, the nurses, the anesthesiologists, and they were hooking up the patient to oxygen, and it all seemed to be going well, but somewhere there was a mistake. And the tanks that were supposed to be oxygen were actually a poison, and they had gotten mislabeled, apparently at the manufacturing company, and the poor person died. But everybody believed they were doing, it seemed right, everything seemed right. You can think that you have the truth and be dead wrong. That's what I'm trying to say here. You really need to have an authoritative basis for what you believe, and what you believe needs to be the authoritative basis of God's Word, because God, who created everything, is the author of everything and control of everything, who has assigned everything its meaning, even you. The truth is, 
your DNA tells you you're a man or you're a woman, you're a boy or a girl, you can't change that. That's the truth. You don't get to pick it. That's the truth. We live in a world that has a sliding scale. They call evil good and good evil. It's a messed up world. And it seems like there's more and more people jumping on these crazy notions. Crazy notions. You can be sincerely wrong. Jesus says this. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I didn't put it up there, but Jesus also said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you know Jesus, he will set you free. That's the whole point. If you know Jesus, he'll set you free. Now, there are seven truths that you need to know about the truth. That's what John is going to write here. There's probably more. But these are the seven that I picked out of the text today. The first one is, it's time for the truth. It's time for the truth. Listen to this. Dear children, this is the last hour. Now, immediately when you read that, you think, 60 minutes. Pastor better be done on time because I got something going after church here today. 60 minutes, right? It makes an hour. John is not using the concept of hour in that way. Now, last week, we had the executive minister for the ABC here, and he spoke on Jesus changing the water to wine, and Jesus said to his mother, he said, woman, try that today. He says, woman, my hour is not yet come. Did he mean that I got a 60-minute window of opportunity here, and I'm not going to waste it on this? Not at all. What he means by hour is the time frame, a time frame. And it's not necessarily 60 minutes, it could be a lot longer, my hour. Because later Jesus will say, my hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. What's he talking about? He says that at the beginning of the Passion Week, and it ends on Easter Sunday. And so what we have here is a full week being an hour. Wow. Wow. Other places, it says the hour is coming, and it talks about the whole millennial kingdom. Now, that's a thousand-year hour. You see, the whole idea is a time frame. There's a time frame. Listen, he says, this is the last hour. Something happened that put John in the age in which he lives as the last hour. I believe it starts with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it will go until his second coming, we are in the last hour. We are living in a period of time that he says, it is the last hour. So the things of the end times are going to come true in this last hour. The rapture is the next thing of the end times. The rapture of the church is going to take place in this last hour. It's going to happen. Boom, the church is going to be gone. He says, as you have already heard, that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. Wow. I find it very interesting. John is the only one in the Bible, 1 John is the only place in the Bible that the word Antichrist appears. Isn't that interesting? Everybody pulls up all these verses all over the Bible, but John, 1 John is the only place the word Antichrist appears. Now, antichrist is really two words, antichristos, antichristos. It, can, it has a double meaning, that word anti. It can mean against, like you were opposed to the Christ, uh, or you could use it in a sense of uh, uh, antitheos, I am opposed to God, I'm an atheist, okay. Or it can mean instead of, in the place of. I am in the place of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 24, there are going to be a lot who will come and say, I am the Messiah. And he's going to mislead many. We've seen him in our day. From Jim Jones to all these others who are of cults and trying to mislead people, saying that they are the Christ. And they mislead. He said, Antichrist is coming. The end time character. But then he said, even now there are many Antichrists. 
people who are spreading false truths about Jesus Christ, and even those who claim that they are Jesus Christ, he says, this is the last hour, and we know it. He moves on and he says, listen, the second thing you need to know we are, is the time of the truth. And the second one is, some actually leave the truth. They went out from us. Apparently there are some who were in the body of believers uh, that he's writing to at the church and that they were in their midst. He says, but, but they have left the faith. Even the Apostle Paul says, Demas has forsaken us. Demas, who's with the Apostle Paul, appeared to be a disciple following Jesus, but he has departed. He's forsaken us. What, for the things of this world? He said, some are going to leave us and we will not see them because they abandoned the faith. But he says, but they did not really belong to us. Further in the verse, he says, none of them belong to us. They really weren't a part of us. People don't leave their faith if they really had genuine faith. He says, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. I got this guy, well, this gal, she's climbing the, the side of the the mountain, it's, it's pretty straight up. <laughs> and, and, and they don't give up. When they get tired, they just hang in there and try to recuperate, and they climb and they climb, and that, that's the way it is. He says, for if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. And when a person says they don't believe in Jesus anymore, it's because they were really never part of us. When I pastored a church in Philadelphia, I was witnessing to my neighbors. And uh, my neighbors were uh, just two doors down, but our, our houses were attached together. We were, they call them row homes, they're attached together. And uh, so two doors down, and, and uh, I was striking up a relationship with them and invited them over for dinner, and we had them at our house for dinner, and, and here's my opportunity. I, I begin to share my faith with my neighbors. And uh, when I'm, I'm talking about Jesus, I said, oh, we've already tried that. I said, what? Tried that? Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, years ago, you, you remember when um, there was a Jesus a freak movement out in California? We were in California and said, yeah, I even went out and got baptized. Yeah, I was, a, I was a Jesus freak. I tried it. But it doesn't work for me like it works for you. So I left. I said, no, no. Here's the big mistake. You don't try Jesus. You commit your life to Jesus. You commit your life to Jesus. You totally turn it over to Jesus. You don't try him and see, okay, God, I, I'm going to be above you, God, to see whether I believe you are good enough to be my God and you pass judgment on God to be God. You don't try him. You acknowledge he is and you surrender to him. You had it all backwards. All backwards. But they left. Why? They went out from us because they did not really belong to us. By their going, they showed that none of them belonged to us. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, it talks about it's about to introduce the, the hall of heroes, all these people who, who live their lives in faith. And then towards the end it says there are even those who God didn't deliver in the miraculous ways. They were sawn asunder, thrown in the den of lions, and, and he lists all these categories, and he says, of whom the world is not worthy of these people. Wow. Just before he says, but we are not of those who shrink back. We don't give up, even in the face of guillotines, even in the face, you, you name it, they don't give up. You know, I think the United States failed in getting out of Afghanistan. Did we need to get out? Yes. 20-year war, come on, modern day, that should not be. The way we got out was a catastrophe. We've left Americans behind. There's one of those lies from politicians. We're not going to leave anybody behind, but we did. The Afghan Christians know that they are facing death. You know what their number one prayer is? 
that in the face of death, I will not recant my faith. I will persevere and die for Jesus. And here we want it so cushy that we got to keep our six feet distance, our mask on. And <laughs> what? I'm, not, I'm afraid to go witness to my neighbor because my neighbor's not vaccinated? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who believe and are saved. Amen? Salvation is God's deliverance from our sin and gives us a pardon and acquittal, forgiveness. He gives us eternal life. The body they may kill, but my soul, my soul is going to live on forever with Jesus. Forever with Jesus. Some leave the truth as a second principle here. True believers stay true, but why do true believers stay true? There's a reason why true believers stay true, and the reason is Christians get the truth. Non-Christians don't get it. They just don't get it. You put the Bible before a non-Christian and have it read it, and they just don't get it. This is the number one way I know a person has really accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. When they read the Bible, they get it. They get it. And we're going to find out why. You see, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. You know, when they anointed a priest in the Old Testament, they took a, a vial of uh, olive oil and they poured it on his head and it would drip down on his head and into his beard and then onto his garments. So they really gave him a good dose. You know, when we anoint, we just put a little dam on your forehead. <laughs> If you really want a good anointing, I'll just put the whole bottle on your head, you know, and drip all over you. And they say, well, you ruined my clothes. But they, they would anoint a priest that way. They anoint a king that way. L listen, they really gave it to him. And the Bible, it says, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. God poured out on Jesus the Holy Spirit. Now, theologians believe that when Jesus was being baptized, remember? He was in the Jordan River and John the Baptist was baptizing him. When he was baptizing him, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven like a dove and landed on him. Joey, could you sit down, please? Please sit down. Thank you. This, this is church service. Not a time to be up and wandering around and getting gum. You sit and listen. Thank you, Joey. Appreciate that. God anointed him by pouring out oil, not oil, but the Holy Spirit, and gave the Holy Spirit to him so that he was led by the Spirit of God. And guess where he was led? Into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. You see, when you get the Holy Spirit, it does not mean your life's going to be all wonderful and beautiful. You might, you might receive Christ, and the next thing you know, you get a report that you're going to have cancer you got to deal with that, all right? That's just the way it is. The Holy Spirit is anointing you, not to take away your cancer, but the Holy Spirit is anointing you, and He's anointing us. He anointed us, it says, and put His Spirit in our hearts. So in, in, in Romans chapter 5, it says, God poured out His, the Spirit on us, and the love of God was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit invades you. He, he anoints you. Uh, he comes inside of you. He's anointed your heart. You are now in the family of God. Wow. Now, I was eight years old when I accepted Jesus. And I didn't feel any Holy Spirit coming. In fact, uh, if I've been on the scales, and I weighed a whole 75 pounds, maybe, all right, Boy, for those days again, huh? And, and the Holy Spirit came on me. I wouldn't have increased an ounce, not even an ounce. The Holy Spirit came on me. He filled me even though I didn't feel it at that moment. The Bible says it is so because the Bible says it is so. It is so. I received the Holy Spirit. Now, the fact that I received him was manifest in something. And here is the something. And all of you know the truth. Oh, there it is. He calls on and he says, you know the truth. You know it. And he says, truth, 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 truth. He's trying to say, listen, Jesus, four times in the Gospel of John, says, 
The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. When I was eight years old and the Holy Spirit came into my life, the way it manifested itself is when I opened up the Bible and read it, it spoke to me. God speaks through His Word. Why is it one person sits in a sanctuary and, and, and they hear the Word of God being preached and proclaimed and being exegeted and being expounded and, and they're deeply convicted and they're moved to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and somebody else is like, water off of a duck's back. It's just, why? Because one, the Spirit of God is manifest in, in them and, and the Spirit of God regenerates and the Spirit of God turns on the lights and they see the truth and they know the truth. They say, this is the truth. They accept the truth. That's how you know you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. You get it. You get it. You get it. I'm knocking on doors in Philadelphia trying to build up the church, inviting people to come to church. I'm in an apartment complex. I knock on the door. The guy says, I'm an agnostic. Go away. <laughs> I said back to him, agnostic. You mean you don't know? I do know. Open the door and I'll tell you. <laughs> but he was being honest. He didn't know. He didn't know the truth. He didn't know the truth. We know the truth. We're to share the truth. We're to live the truth. Because the Holy Spirit's anointed us with the truth. He is the truth. He lives in me. I have the truth living in me. And I should, I should be looking at everything in this world through a biblical worldview of the Holy Spirit verifying what the Word of God says and what's happening in my world, and I will live and know the truth. It'll come right down to practical things that I will speak the truth. I won't tell little embellished stories. I love to embellish stories, though. But then afterward, I have to correct them, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I like to do it just to get a rise out of people. It's kind of like telling a joke, and then you say, well, you, you, the punchline. And then afterward, I say, well, no, it really wasn't like that. <laughs> you know, at the previous church, the secretary's office was right as you walk in, and it had a, a wall, up, and she was just on the other side of it. And as I'd walk by, I would take every step. I'd go down a little bit lower and say, I'm going to the basement. I was lying. There was no basement. <laughs> But, but you get the whole idea. Listen, sometimes we embellish the truth in such a way it is not true. It's a lie. Oh, tell them that I'm not here. Well, you know you're going to be leaving, so maybe I can justify that. That's a lie. It's a lie. But we tell even bigger whoppers of that. He said, listen, Christians get the truth. They know the truth. They know when they are lying and when they're not. And they live the truth. They live the truth. Liars, on the other hand, they deny the truth. They deny the truth. Listen to what he says. John says, this, you've got to know this. Liars deny the truth. Who is a liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That man is a liar, denying that Jesus is the Christ. Well, I was in Dubai, we were on the bus, and the, the, the bus guide was uh, an Egyptian Muslim. And somebody in our crowd asked him to explain as we went by a mosque, uh, what is the difference between the Muslims and Christianity? And he did a very good job. Except for the part that he said, hey, we Muslims, we accept that Jesus is, you know, the Christ. And he said, and we believe that he died, and he's a great prophet, but we don't believe that he rose from the dead, and we do not believe that he is the Son of God. Well, that was close, but it was not the truth. You know what this Bible verse says? They deny that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. They are a liar. A liar, a liar. Jesus said, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. It's not Muhammad. It's not Buddha. Whoever, it's Jesus. And Jesus alone is the way of salvation. Jesus alone. This is what Jesus said. You belong to your father, the devil, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, and boy, does he lie, 
He speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. What he is saying back in the garden, when God told Adam not to eat of the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil, he came along and said, oh, has God really said? Oh, yeah, if we're not to eat of it. Oh, God's pulling a fast one on you. God knows the day you eat thereof, you, you know, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be like God. Here's the biggest lie of all. They're already like God. We're made in the image of God. And he took a truth and twisted it and distorted it. You're going to be like God. I, I, what he was really doing is say, God withheld from you. God has evil intentions. He is a liar. And he's always a liar. He makes sin look so good. You want to cave into it. You want to give into it. You want to do it. He makes it look so good. He, he's a liar and a deceiver. He says, listen, who, who is a liar but the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ? But then he says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But, woe, but whoever disowns me before men, I will dis, disown him before my Father in heaven. Wow. It's very, very important that you know Jesus as your Savior and that you acknowledge him and that you admit to it and that you tell about it because he will acknowledge you in heaven. Who is a liar? The man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is an antichrist. What? He denies the Father and the Son and no one who denies the Son has the Father. Listen, denies, denies, denies. Satan is the master deceiver and, and liar. He'll lie to you every time. Notice what the text says. Such a man is the Antichrist. Now it appears in John that he uses the word Antichrist in three different ways. He uses it for the spirit of Antichrist, which it begins all the way back in the Garden of Eden as those who are opposing God, they're anti-God, and the very first proclamation of the gospel is that the woman would have a seed, and he is going to fight against that seed all the way down through time. And so there's a spirit that is anti-God, anti-Christ, and it is still in the world today. The second way that he uses it is for false teachers, <laughs> like these people. Such a man is an anti-Christ. People often ask me, who's the Antichrist? So that's just a loaded question. I could start naming off every single false teacher, every cult leader. I mean, these false, I can name them. They're Antichrist. They are against Christ. They're false teachers. But it's also used of that end time person who is the Antichrist, who sits himself in the temple, shows himself off to be God, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And God sends a strong delusion so that people believe his lies. God just turns them over. Is that what you want? You want this lies? You want these lies? You want these lies? Let them believe them. He goes on and says, but whoever acknowledges, and that doesn't mean just say, oh yeah, Jesus is the Christ, but acknowledge means that, that this is your knowledge. This is what you know. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Whoever acknowledges the Son also has the Father. <laughs> like at the baptism, the, the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit descends upon him, and there's Christ. It's the three in one right there. And what we have here is they have the Father, I have the Son, and I have the anointing of the Spirit. I have the three in one. Isn't that amazing? That's what I have. That's what's in me. That's what I have. I want you to think about this. Peter's a guy just like you and me, right? You know the story. Peter denied the truth three times. Jesus is in being tried, and he's outside warming himself by the fire. And you see the gal there, the gal says to him, uh, were you with him? A oh, woman, I don't know him. <laughs> Not much longer, a guy says, uh, man, uh, Really, really, I think you were with him. And he says, I am not with him. Then another one, we believe it was uh, Malchus, the high priest's servant who had his ear cut off, says, uh, hey, you're a Galilean. You speak like him, and you, you, you were with him. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. 
And we all feel sorry for Peter, don't we? Because you've been at work. A hot topic comes up that involves the Christian faith, maybe an abortion. Everybody there is an abortionist. Maybe it's on all this junk, this critical stuff that's going on today, and you know know, that's counter-biblical Christian, and you just zip your mouth. Maybe it's something else. It's gossip going on about someone, and you know the truth, but... You don't want the controversy and you don't want to put it online. Maybe it's somebody telling you, hey, maybe it's the boss saying, hey, if anybody calls, tell them I'm not in my office. Hmm. And you have to do that which is against your convictions. You think. It seems right, the right thing to do. The boss told me I got to obey my boss. And you compromise your value. And you deny the Lord. Don't you feel sorry for Peter? I kind of feel sorry for Peter. You know why? Because I'm just like Peter. You're just like Peter. You know, Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times, and then the cock will crow, and the cock crows, and he is so guilty. You know how that is. I know how that is. When I have compromised my faith, and I have in some way denied Jesus, And the Spirit convicts me, and I know what I've done is wrong. It's that sinking, guilty feeling. You know what I'm talking about. Jesus doesn't leave Peter there. After he raised from the dead and he's gathered the disciples together in the last chapter of the book of John, he turns to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? (laughs) You know what he's asking? Are you still a denier or do you or have you repented and are, are you now do you love me? <laughs> Second time, Peter, then do you truly love me? Third time, Peter, the truly is dropped. It's just Peter, do you love me? Two different Greek words going on there. Do you love me? And, and Peter says to the first time, I, yes Lord, I love you. He says, feed my sheep. You see, with forgiveness is restoration with God. And and Peter is is forgiven and he's restored. And the second time when he asked, he said, take care of my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Don't, don't, see, we get so down on ourselves because, man, I'm such a failure. I'm such a mess. What can I ever do for God? And God says, as soon as I forgive you, get involved in ministry. Get back on track. Serve me. I'm restoring you. Do you love me, Peter? He says, feed my sheep. Get the word out. Share the word. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. you got to get the message out. you got to tell people about Jesus. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. The fifth thing I see here is Jesus rewards the truth. See, that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. This has been my little icon ever since I started the first John here is you got to be plugged in to Jesus. <laughs> you got to be plugged into Jesus. You got to remain in him and he's remaining in you. If it does, if the word remains in you, you will remain in the son of God and the father. So you're going to be plugged into Jesus and you're going to be plugged into the father. You're going to be a real Christian. Wow. With the truth remaining in you. Don't abandon the truth. Don't don't join the lie. Speak the truth. Live the truth. Why? There's a great reward. And this is what he has promised, even eternal life. Uh, This is like uh, my same old illustration, the escalator that takes you up to heaven. There is a reward for living in the truth. What's the truth? Jesus is the truth. When you know Jesus, your reward is eternal life. He says, I'm writing these things. He says, listen, this is what I'm writing. I'm writing these these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Let me go back to that verse. There's a way that seems right. Our culture, every word, is screaming out a different way. And we have to say, no, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. We come down to the final thing. He says, I want you to know the anointing teaches you the truth. 
as for you, he points it right out. He's pointing his finger at us. We're the, we're the readers. He's, he's pointing his finger. He says, for you, the anointing that he says here, the anointing, which is the Holy Spirit, the, his anointing. And then the third time he says it in this verse, he says, the anointing is real. Listen, what I'm talking about is real. The Holy Spirit is real. When you embrace Christ as your Savior, you get the Holy Spirit, whether you felt him or not. You've got him. He is real. He shows you the truth. You know the truth. He's the one that prompts you and, and, and he convicts you and he pricks your conscience when you don't do the truth so that he wants you to do the truth. The anointing is real, he says. I want you to know this. And he's there to teach you. To teach you. He says it three times. Teach, teach, taught. He says, you do not need anyone to teach you. You know, I'm a Bible teacher. <laughs> Most of my students say, well, the Bible says I don't even need you. It's true. It's true. If you were dropped out of an airplane over an isolated island in the South Pacific, I'll make it at least a warm place, and with you, the only thing that was dropped into was the Bible, you'd have everything you need to grow as a Christian. The Word of God, the Spirit of God teaching you, you would have everything you need. Now, Jesus is also given to the church teachers. I know that from Ephesians 4. I'm one of them. He's given to the church teachers to give you like a rapid grow. Rather than on your own and the Holy Spirit, he's given teachers and, and I have a whole collection of teachers before me and, and they're in my library and I consult them to see what people before me have heard God say and whether what God's speaking to me and what God said to them is the same because God is not about to introduce some new revelation to me that he's never given to somebody before and, and I, then I, I'm able to compare with what great men of the faith in the past have heard God say and what I'm hearing him say and I share it with you. Yeah, it's to our advantage. But you don't need me. It's a big help. All you need is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. You've got everything you need to grow in your Christian faith. I like this verse because it says, if the anointing you received remains in you, <laughs> if the anointing remains in you, boom, the Holy Spirit remains in me. He does. He's with me forever. And the bottom it says, just as it, the teaching of the anointing, Remain in him. Listen, I, I'm connected. It's two ways. He's in me, I'm in him. He's in me, I'm in him. He's in me, I'm in him. And he teaches, and I grow in my faith. Wow. There's been a lot in this passage. I hope you noticed it. But what can we take away today? The truth about time. We are in the last hour. We are in the last hour. We are getting closer and closer to the coming of the Lord. We are in the last hour. Don't leave the truth, even if the times get tough. Don't leave the truth. Why? Because we Christians get the truth. Get more in your Bible. Learn more truth. It will give you stability when everything around you is falling. Liars will oppose the truth. You will find the more you're in the Word of God and the more you're studying and living for Jesus, the more countercultural you are. You're going to be fighting against the, the grain. The current's going against you and you're going to be swimming harder and harder against it because liars will oppose the truth. But expect the payoff. Our reward will be great in heaven. Don't distort the truth. Don't twist it. Don't pervert it. Let the truth have its way in you. Receive the anointed truth. Wouldn't be a bad idea when you crack open your Bible to pray and say, Father, may the Holy Spirit teach me while I read. Invite that teaching, that anointing to go to work. One final thought. Here's my one final thought. Jesus prayed for you in John 17. And in his prayer, this is what he prayed to the Father. Father, sanctify them, that's you and me, by the truth. And then here it is. Your word is truth. 
Your word is truth. You want to live the truth? You live in the Bible. You live in the Bible. You let the Bible live in you. Because the Bible is called the word of Christ. It's the word of Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to be the people who know the truth, live the truth, because we have Jesus, our Savior, who is the truth. Lord, uh, we ask for your blessing to abide upon us so that when we leave this place, we leave in such a way that the truth uh, just flows from us. People see the truth and they ask us the reason of hope we have that we might point them to the truth. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.